So thank you everyone for coming and listening to me rant about poetry. Um, before I begin, I should say that, um, I just explain where this, this paper has come from. Um, first of all, I think I've had, as uh, Dad has said, an abiding interest in poetry for my whole life. Um, but that became particularly focused for me at Regent College, um, sitting under the tutelage of Lauren Wilkinson, who spoke about the ways in which um, art in all its forms um, in many ways offer, offers us a way of knowing God that theology or apologetics cannot. I don't know why it suddenly went dark, but anyway, oh, there we go, okay. Um, so that's, that's two strands of my life, I suppose. There's, you know, my, my childhood in poetry and loving it, and then there's the way that it fed my faith. But I'm gonna acknowledge a third strand um, that, that is hidden in what I am about to say, but is incredibly important to what I have to say. Um, and that is that this paper, um, which, I, which I did end up publishing, in fact came out of a high school English classroom um, studying the poetry of Gwen Howard. Um, and I want to acknowledge the young women behind all of this thinking, because it wasn't just me. And it would be remiss of me if I did not acknowledge those people. None of them are doing English now. Um, but I believe that their life was changed by the encounter with poetry, just as mine was changed by my encounter with them. So I wanted to start by acknowledging that class. Um, but so, so the poetry of Gwen Howard, I'm gonna do something strange and not begin with Gwen Howard. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna start with this poem. This is a poem that I read well before I um, came into contact with the poetry of Gwen Howard. Um, she's not Australian, but she is almost an exact contemporary of Gwen Howard. I believe she even died in the same year. Um, her name is Denise Levitov, for those of you who don't know her. She was an English poet who migrated and became American, <coughs> so went the other way to T.S. Eliot. Um, and in her heritage, I, I believe she had one Jewish parent, um, and may, I'm getting this wrong, but anyway, she, um, she became Catholic. Um, this is one of the later poems that she wrote, and it's in a suite of poems called A Mass from the Day of St. Thomas Didymus. And some of you will know that that is Thomas the Doubter. I think that's really important. It's called Credo, which immediately signifies that it's supposed to sit, sit alongside the creeds. Um, I'll read it for you and then, and then perhaps talk through, I think, where this puts us. Uh, yeah, I'm going to read it first because she's going to say it better than I can. I believe the earth exists and in each minimote of its dust, the holy glow of thy candle. Thou unknown, I know, thou spirit, giver, lover of making, of the wrought letter, help thou my unbelief. Drift, grey become gold in the beam of vision. I believe and interrupt my belief with doubt. I doubt and interrupt my belief. Oh, did I get that wrong? I doubt and interrupt my doubt with belief. B beloved threatened world, each minimote. Not the poisonous luminescence forced out of its privacy, the sacred lock of its cell broken. No, the ordinary glow of common dust in ancient sunlight. Be that I may believe, amen. This poem blew me out of the water when I read it. <laughs> I think the first thing to say when you, when you read this poem is it sits alongside and a little bit against the creed. Not in terms of what it's proposing about Christian orthodoxy at all, but perhaps the way it approaches it. So if the creeds approach Christian truth via proposition, this is what we believe, this is what we believe, this is what believe, almost by intellectual assent, if you like. This one does something quite different. I believe the earth, we almost expect it to say, is created by God, right? I believe the earth exists and in each minimote of its dust the holy glow of thy candle. This image of the candle, of the light, that, that we can only know what light is by what it illuminates, if you will. 
We can only know God by what he illuminates, by what he has created, is what she's getting at here, if you can see that. If I can destroy it by making it a proposition for a second. Thou unknown I know, and that's where that paradox comes in. She can know God only by what exists, by what is sensory. Lover of making of the wrought letter. And here's something interesting starts to happen. Lover of making of the wrought letter, which is this indirect reference to what we're looking at here, right? This is the wrought letter. Help thou my unbelief. Drift, grey become bold in the beam of vision. I believe and interrupt my belief with doubt. I doubt and interrupt my doubt with belief. It is important to now come back to a mass from the day of St. Thomas Didymus. And of course, we all know what Thomas was famous for, right? Thomas was famous for saying, Lord, I can't believe you. I can't believe this is you again. How can you be, which is a pretty sensible question if you ask me. I thought you were dead. And Jesus says to him, here, come put your hand in my side. So he turns, what, what I think that Levitov is doing here is turning that question from a sign of weakness into a sign of humanity, to a transformative moment where the sensory is not a sign of weakness, but a sign of something more. I think this bit's interesting here. Can you see how the rhythms collapsed here? Not the poisonous luminescence forced out of its privacy, the sacred lock of its cell broken. See, it sounds different. It sounds more like a sentence. No, the ordinary glow of common dust in ancient sunlight. This bit here seems to be almost not poetry. And I think that's important. It's not poetry. If I can um, come back to this at some point, if I can say this, that I think that I was teaching this morning and I have a student in the audience and I said to them, as I say to you now, to understand poetry or to apprehend any kind of art form, if I can move it beyond poetry, you've got to think with your ears first and your head second. You've got to think with your ears first and your head second. To apprehend poetry, you actually need to be human first before you are a mind. So you note here that Enjambment, which means the pause at the end of, I believe the earth, pause, exists. And it is that pause that asks you to consider the difference between this one and the creed. So you actually need your ears to understand what she's doing. Now, the fact that you need your ears is significant because that is a different epistemological starting point. That means you have to be a body before you are a mind. For Christians, this is really, really significant. Because the strange thing about our faith is that we believe not in an idea, not in a description of perfection, not in any of those things. We believe in the incarnation. We believe in God made man. That's what we believe in. I remember hearing a Jesuit priest talking about this and I've never forgotten it. <laughs> he said that um, God was so invested in flesh that he did it not once, not twice, but three times. Once at creation, once in the incarnation and once at the resurrection. So committed was he to flesh. I think that's what Levitov is getting at here. Let's not be afraid of flesh to apprehend truly the extraordinary moment of creation, resurrection, sorry, creation, incarnation, resurrection. I wonder if it is actually art that allows us to apprehend that better than theology. And the reason for that is because you need your body to apprehend it. So the implication of this, what does that suggest? This little kind of rant that I've just gone on. How do we apprehend God if the business of a Christian is to know God? How do we apprehend him? I'm not saying, I mean, I love theology as much as the next person, but I suppose I'm suggesting here tonight that theology can perhaps get us closer to the center. Um, if I can qualify that by saying that the only way we come at the center is obliquely via human flesh. What is the role of theology? What is the role of poetry? and I broaden that to include art. 
in the Christian tradition. And all of that suggests this, and that's, that's what gets me interested in the poetry of Gwen Harwood. Poetry in any art form necessarily localizes. It necessarily takes an idea and makes it um, particular, a particular place, a particular way of saying it, a particular sound. Um, I'm thinking now of you know, the, the Australian um, artist, Margaret Ollie. She's about place. She is not about an idea. She's it about ideas insofar as she is about place. Does that make any sense? So, so art is necessarily local. What does that mean? I then asked, while I was at Regent, as a daughter of Australia. What does that mean? What does that mean as a woman? What does that mean? So, just to divert and undo everything I've said, um, I've put up here a quotation from David Jones, who is both a theologian and a poet. Um, he's a, a Catholic thinker, artist, and he says this, whereas the body is not an infirmity, but a unique benefit and splendor, a thing denied to angels and unconscious in animals. No wonder then that theology regards the body as a unique good, without body, without sacrament. Thus, with relative suddenness, the analogy between what we call the arts and the thing that Christians call the Eucharist, the Eucharistic signs become, if still but vaguely, apparent. It became increasingly evident that this analogy applied to the whole gamut of making. If I can domesticate that, I think this speaks against the dualistic heritage that we carry around, even still in theology, which would suggest that our minds are somehow a better way of approaching God than our bodies. It, it speaks directly against that. But the second thing it does is this last sentence here, this analogy applied to the whole gamut of making. You remember I um, pointed out in that beautiful poem of Levitov's, if I can go back there, this lover of making. What we are looking at here in Levitov's act of making, she becomes Imago Dei. In the act of making and using her senses to make, just as we apprehend through our senses, she becomes the little creator, sewn in, if you will, to God's, God's act of creation in the first place, in his fleshing. Flannery O'Connor is a bit easier to take. Um, do any of you know Flannery O'Connor? She's a, um, a fiction writer from the American South. She died young, she's fabulous. Um, but she says this, if you shy away from sense experience, you will not be able to read fiction, but you will not be able to apprehend anything else in this world either. Because every mystery that reaches the human mind, except in the final stages of contemplative prayer, does so by way of the senses. Christ didn't redeem us by a direct intellectual act, but became incarnate in human form. All this may seem a long way from the subject of fiction, but it is not, for the main concern of fiction, of the fiction writer, is with mystery as it is incarnated in human life. And insofar as the business of any artist is to incarnate an idea or incarnate thinking or incarnate mystery, they are closer, I would argue, than many of our most esteemed theologians, including this one carrying on from the front at the moment. So um, for that reason, I became interested in Gwen Howard. So if that is true, what if I am Australian? What if I am a woman? What if my life is, probably like the most of you, if we're honest about what our lives actually constitute every day, mostly composed of little quotidian moments of cleaning, tidying, arranging, attending, doing things that seem meaningless. What if this is my life? Where is God? Okay, I'm gonna switch a bit here um, before I come back to Gwen Harwood. I keep promising I'll get to Gwen Harwood, but I will. <laughs> um, as I approached these poems, I was informed and 
uh, taught, taught to come at it a particular way, I suppose, in my reading of the Gospel of Luke. If you remember, I'm not going to talk about any passage in particular, but if, if you remember, it's shaped by stories of um, two sets of people, um, by lowly women, if you remember that, if you count them. Structurally, it begins and ends with women, with one Mary and it finishes with another. And then there's a few, few others dotted really strategically throughout the whole gospel. And these are they. Mary, the mother of Jesus, Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, Anna, the prophetess, the bleeding woman, the faithful widow, Mary Magdalene. All these women apprehend what Christ is about. They apprehend the mystery. I'm not suggesting that the historical women necessarily did, but I think this is what Luke is trying to get at. They sit alongside um, some of the men who try to apprehend Jesus and claim what he is doing, culminating in Christ um, with, with Jesus setting up the, the, the Last Supper. Do you remember this? And they're having an argument about who will sit next to him. Do you remember this? <laughs> And who will be the greatest, one says. I'm the greatest. I want to sit at the left. And, and meanwhile, we've got, you know, women bringing in platters of food and washing Jesus. You remember all of this, right? So there's this stark contrast. And anytime there's a pattern and a contrast, an author's trying to do something. And I think it actually culminates when Jesus turns and says, I am among you as the one who serves. Now, as a young girl, I think I read that line as... The moral of the story is, Sarah, that you should serve everyone else and make yourself last. The moral of the story is that you should unselve yourself, Sarah, and be a model of selflessness. I no longer think this because I actually want to look at that word serves in a much more quotidian way. I want to look at that word serves as the Actually, the act of hospitality, of serving, of doing the washing up, of tidying, right? Of getting my hands dirty in the act of smallness. And in that smallness, we actually find what it is that Christ is doing in the act of incarnation. Because if we know anything about the incarnation, it is that the creator of the universe entered it and became small. So... I told my mum I was going to give her a shout out tonight. Mm -hmm. This is my shout out. Um, I would now like to come to the poetry of Gwen Howard. First of all, I will say, I just want to give you a bit of a sketch about how she has been traditionally read. Um, just so you can get some sense of the scale of what my girls came up with. It's pretty extraordinary, like they were 17. <laughs> she has been read mostly as a, a romantic poet, and I mean that capital R. So. She's interested in the ways in which um, the natural world and the human experience of it um, uh, become the site of the divine. And she has said that. She's interested in, in, romant in romantic poetry. Um, she's also been read by feminists as a feminist poet. Um, but up until my 17-year-olds came to it, she had not been read as a religious poet at all. At all. The other thing I want to tell you before I begin, another shout out to my mum, just to give you some idea of the scale of intelligence of this woman, <laughs> she didn't do any degree, FYI, no degree at all. She was married to a professor of philosophy and I think basically read all his books from off the floor. Um, Gwen Harwood wrote, she had four children and legend has it that she could write her poetry during the day while she was caring for her children and commit the whole thing to memory and write it down at night time. Wow. When we get to the violets, I think you'll soon see why that's incredible. Okay, but let me read you Mother Who, Mother Who Gave Me Life. Mum, this is for you. Mother Who Gave Me Life, I think of women bearing women. Forgive me the wisdom I would not learn from you. It is not for my children I walk on earth in the light of the living. It is for you, the wild daughters becoming women, anguish of seasons burning backward in time to those other bodies, your mother and hers and beyond, speech growing stranger 
on thresholds of ice, rock, fire, bones changing, heads inclining, to monkey bosom, lemo abreast, guileless milk of the word. I prayed you would live to see Halley's Comet a second time. The sister said, when she died, she was folding a little towel. You left the world so, having lived nearly 30,000 days, a fabric of marvels folded down to a little space. At our last meeting, I closed the ward door of heavy glass between us and saw your face crumple, fine threadbare linen, worn, still good to the last, then somehow smooth to a smile so I should not see your tears. Anguish, remembered hours. A lamp on embroidered linen, my supper set out, your voice calling me in as darkness falls on my father's house. It's hard to read that and not cry. <laughs> it's an extraordinary poem, isn't it? Particularly in the presence of my mum. <laughs> Oh, Mum. She's always talking about her deathbed. <laughs> Has she told you about it? <laughs> she wants to put on her headstone, at last a good rest. <laughs> and the other one was, I told you so, I was sick. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> this poem seems like a strange place to start on the subject of... Um, sacramental poetry on, on the incarnation. Seems like a really, really strange place to start, but I'm gonna start here nevertheless. Um, it's addressed directly to her mother. So across a kind of threshold from life into death. Um, and it's a celebration of matrilineal heritage, right? I think of my mother and her mother and her mother. And you can see in those first four stanzas, you can see her moving backwards through time until she gets to monkey bosom, lemo breast. See that? Guileless milk of the word. Then she gets there, and I think this is where I want to start. Guileless milk of the word. Um, I think, first of all, I'd like to say that this guileless milk of the word is a deliberate allusion to the logos, to John's gospel. It's a deliberate allusion to the word that gave life. Um, but this guileless milk of the word here also deliberately alludes to, with that monkey bosom, lemo breast, the act of breastfeeding, right? She's collapsed the two. Um, the, the, that a pounding alliteration, did you hear that? And I'm only saying that because we need our ears with poetry. That pounding alliteration, burning backward in time to those other bodies, right? You can almost hear this drumbeat of activity, this climax in... Um, understanding, I suppose, the, the lifeblood of the matrilineal heritage as she apprehends her mother's domestic activity. And that monosyllabic ice, rock, fire kind of helps that, that momentum. It connects these women, not to Hills Hoist clotheslines, right, but to the generative and original drumbeat of life. Um, and the dominance of those sound devices moves the poem forwards and it indicates not only Howard's musical ear, she had an exceptional musical ear, but also the movement towards a kind of sensory and temporal conclusion of the stanza. And these swiftly moving stanzas reach an astonishing conclusion as they come to rest on that guileless milk of the word. It connects the domestic quotidian work of breastfeeding with the logos, the word. And that line, draws from the Apostle, Peter's uh, the Apostle Peter's exhortation to the Gentile church that it forsake deceit and instead, you remember the verse, newborn babes long for the guileless milk of the word in order that by it you may grow into salvation if you have tasted that the Lord is good. So you can imagine what some feminist critics have done with that and I don't disagree with them, actually. But what I want to say here is that what I think Harwood is doing theologically as she moves her poem, as she works with her poem, is that she's inverting a kind of male way of knowing that I've talked about in Luke. And I want to say here, I don't think, I'm not here talking about 
um, all women get this and all men don't. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking that a, um, a committed, downwardly mobile, fleshed experience. That's what I am calling the feminine here. Howard inverts that male way of knowing that I want to be next to Jesus and know and apprehend the logos or the word to which Peter refers and instead resituates that word as female. So rather than arriving at language metaphysically or directly, that poisonous luminescence that Denise Levitov spoke about, the breastfeeding woman arrives at language or even divine language through her body. Through her body. So Howard, I think she, she insists on yoking the quotidian with the numinous or the, the divine, the transcendent, right? The following stanza places the image of Halley's Comet, big, universal, extraordinary, alongside the image of her mother folding a little towel. I prayed you live to see Halley's Comet a second time. The sister said when she died, she was folding a little towel. You can hear that contrast between grandeur and smallness and that delicate alliteration of little towel. It, it kind of um, accentuates, I suppose, the smallness. You left the world so, having lived nearly 30,000 days, a fabric of marvels folded down to a little space. It begins to appear here that her mother's life has been, indeed been a fabric of marvels folded down to a little space. As the death that is the ward door of heavy glass, glass comes between the living daughter and the dead mother. And so two stanzas before the conclusion of the poem, Howard's rousing discovery that women are the bearers of life and the guileless milk of the word appears cauterized by death. It appears lost. Um, but I think it's the final two stanzas. This is, this is where my girls really, really showed me what they could do. She reroutes our attention. Um, the, second last, the last line of the, the second to last stanza promises nothing but anguish remembered hours. And whenever Howard puts those colons there, she's, her, her poetic mind moves back in time. So she's moved back through time. Um, and her musical devices conjure that existential loss because um, if you can see there on your poem, after that colon, you, you're pausing. And the act of that pause constitutes the loss of her mother. Um, but it's in that void of absence that memory and her final image comes. Then somehow smooth to a smile so I should not see your tears, anguish, remembered hours, pause. A lamp on embroidered linen, my supper set out, your voice calling me in as darkness falls on my father's house. Up until my 17-year-old readers had come to this poem, not one single decorated professor of English had ever seen that last stanza like they did. We, read, we went to the chapel to read this and all of a sudden, one of my students who was a Greek Orthodox student, and so I suppose because of that experience had been tutored to see this in this way, looked at that last stanza and said, it's the Eucharist, it's the Eucharist, it's communion, that's what's going on here. A lamp on embroidered linen, my supper set out, your voice calling me in as darkness falls on my father's house. And so this little suburban house in which she is remembering her mother operating is in fact the site of the holy. It is the small where God has come to dwell. The father's house indicates, I suppose, the cathedral, except the cathedral has become a, Queensland, a Queenslander, which was where Gwen Howard grew up. And this is interesting. Look at that, your voice. We come back to the logos, right? The word, the word became flesh. Do you remember that? But whose is the voice? Whose is the voice? In a church, it would be the priest, wouldn't it? If you're in a Catholic church, Gwen Howard was Anglo-Catholic, it would only be a man. But the voice here is her mother's voice, who has prepared the supper, who is preparing and doling out the Eucharist, the communion to her children. 
And so all of a sudden, the domestic and the, the marvel fold into a little towel is not officiated by a man in church, but by a woman undertaking domestic, quotidian, folding, tidying, serving food. Just as, so giving the sensory to her children, just as Harwood is offering us the sensory through her poem. It's the same activity. Interestingly, this is a side note. Um, when I was at Regent, I took a class called The Christian Life and we looked at, uh, sorry, not The Christian Life, The Christian Imagination. And we sat down and tried to think of um, as many Protestant artists as, as we could. It's really hard. If they are Protestant, they're usually Anglo-Catholic, like T.S. Eliot, but it's really hard. You can think of some Dutch artists, but they're mostly Catholic. And in our talking, we finally decided that perhaps the reason for that is the Protestant habit, and I am a Protestant, let me say that, and I'm throwing it out to my fellow Protestants. But here's the challenge. We do tend to approach our faith using this. We do tend to approach our faith by intellectual apprehension. And the Catholics, when, when you ask a Catholic how a church service, service was, they don't talk about the sermon, which is what, if we ask each other how church was, what we mean is how was the sermon? If a Catholic asks how church was, they're not talking about that, they're talking about the Eucharist. <laughs> I heard some stories about some Catholics just kind of avoiding the homily, so they just duck in for the Eucharist and run back out again. Um, but the point of this is that the Eucharist is sensory, right? So that explains, I suppose, Catholic artists and the way they're coming at their faith via the sensory. Anyway, if I can come back to the poem. After nine quatrains of a celebration of matrilineal heritage and the ways in which language quivers through each generation born of woman, the last line is the first reference to a man, her father's house. And in this light, that phrase is arresting. Now, as I, I've said this before, you can imagine what different um, Australian feminist writers have made of that, and fair enough. Um, but I want to say that I actually think Howard was intentionally using the father's house to mean both her father, her living father's suburban Queenslander, and the divine house of God. This is here, this is her here. She says, can I go back to the origins of what poetry first was to me? I hear my, grandfather, my grandmother's voice reciting, bind me a wreath of flowers and set it on my brows for I must go while I am young home to my father's house. At the time, I did not realize that the girl dying of disappointment in love was going to a heavenly mansion. The words my father's house meant for me the small weatherboard cottage on stumps. When you are married, you had a house of your own, but when you are young, you always went home to your father's house. Can you see here how she's actually binding those two together? And it's the binding of those two together that's the most exciting thing because that's the act of the incarnation, isn't it? The act of the small with the act of the cosmic. Okay, I'm gonna to go to another one now. I think this is my favorite Harwood poem. I promised I'd tell you some Harwood lore. Um, actually, no, pause there. I'm gonna read it first. The Violets is concerned, just like Mother Who Gave Me Life, with the act of memory, with, the, with what poetry can do to preserve memory and those we have lost. Um, let me read it first. The Violets. It is dusk and cold. I kneel to pick frail melancholy flowers among ashes and loam. The melting west is striped like ice cream. While I try whistling a trill close by his nest, our blackbird frets and strops his beak indifferent to Scarlatti's song. Ambiguous light, ambiguous sky. Towards nightfall, waking from the fearful that should read, half sleep of a hot afternoon at our first house in Mitchelton, I ran to my mother calling for breakfast. Laughing, it will be night soon, you goose, her long hair falling down to her waist. She dried my tearful face as I sobbed, where's morning gone? And carried me downstairs to see spring violets in their loamy bed. Hungry and cross, I would not hold their sweetness or be comforted, even when my father, whistling, 
came from work, but used my tears to scold the thing I could not grasp or name that, when I slept, had stolen from me those hours of unreturning light. Into my father's house we went, and you're reading that differently now. Young parents and their restless child to light the lamp and the wood stove while duck surrendered pink and white to blurring darkness. Reconciled, I took my supper and was sent to innocent sleep. Years cannot move, nor death's disorienting scale distort those lamp-lit presences. A child with milk and storybook, my father bending to inhale the, the gathered flowers with tenderness, stroking my mother's gold-brown hair. Stone, Corlew's, stone Curlew's call from Kedron Brook. Faint scent of violets drift in air. First of all, I think you have to admit what a beautiful poem it is. <laughs> um, the easiest way to interpret this poem is to watch her indents. When she moves in, that means she's moving into memory. And as she moves, un undoes the indent, she's moving back into the present. That's the easiest way to um, interpret what's going on here. Um, but I first want to I first want to say, can you see immediately the strains of what my girls picked up in Mother Who Gave Me Life? You can see the transformative power of the mother of those little quotidian acts. And again, her father's house. Um, now I want to just draw your attention to, can you see that little Scarlatti song there? Can you see that? She mentioned Scarlatti's song and I read this and I taught this for like two or three years and couldn't work out what on earth, why she had been so specific as to mention Scarlatti's song. Until, until I discovered with the help of my good friend, um, Laurel Moffat, who's good at this stuff. The rhythm of this poem is a Scarlatti fugue. Let me say that again. The rhythm of this poem is a Scarlatti fugue and she wrote that doing the washing up. <laughs> Isn't that mind-blowing? Even more, Scarlatti's fugue, Scarlatti's fugues build their themes progressively through octaves. I, I do this theme here and then I move up an octave and then I repeat it and then I riff on it and then up one and then down one and so forth. Can you see the way she is moving from past to present, just as Scarlatti would move through the octaves. Hence the reference to Scarlatti's fugue. I still can't believe she did that, doing the washing up, but anyway. Um, you can see though that that's, this is significant, right? The, the child's poignant question, where's morning gone? Do you all remember that feeling? You know, when you, have a mid, when you have a nap and it's such a good nap, you wake up thinking, whoa, where am I? right, that disorienting moment. Here she draws a parallel between that and the middle-aged woman's recognition that time has gone. The small moment where an afternoon distorts a sense of my day actually is foreshadows the middle-aged woman's recognition that my decades have gone. That memory it's an abrupt revision of her melancholy, right? And it's represented by that indentation I spoke about. And it catapults the reader into this defiant, defiance in the face of death. Years cannot move, she says, nor death's disorienting scale distort those lamplit presences. Go away, death. And then she indents back again, but in a slightly different way. A child with milk and storybook, my father bending to inhale the gathered flowers with tenderness, stroking my mother's gold brown hair. Stone Curlew's call from Kedron Brook. Faint scent of violets drift in air. Can you see here, as you look at the structure of the poem, the way the speaker's mind moves contrary to death, backwards, just as time moves forward? And the lamp-lit presences, that act of the quotidian Eucharist, transcends the momentary. It makes the ordinary extraordinary. It makes the moment Christ-like. Um, and so while it's clear that memory is the vehicle through which the adult speaker finds peace, that's clear. And most, um, most of the, the commentary on this 
poem identifies that. The thing that my girls picked up is that all of that neglects the vision towards which the memory moves. It moves to the moment of the Eucharist, that domestic scene, the lamplit presences that illuminate her mother's gold brown hair in her father's house. They're all remarkably concordant, aren't they? With the, vi with the vision of the, qu the quotidian Eucharist in the mother who gave me life. And I think the thing that blew me away with Harwood here is these divine moments are not divine in spite of our boundedness in our bodies or in spite of the fact that Gwen Harwood was a housewife in Tasmania, but because of it, because of it. The memory offers the adult speaker access to the holy of holies officiated for Harwood, not by a priest, but by her mother and her father. So, do you want to do some philosophy now? <laughs> this is David Bentley Hart. <laughs> Have we all got our big girl pants on and our big boy pants on? Um, he says, to, almost to describe what it is that Harwood is doing, thus for Christian thought, to know the world truly is achieved not through a positivistic reconstruction of its sufficient reason, but through an openness before glory, a willingness to orient one's will toward the light of being and to receive the world as gift. The truth of being is poetic before it is rational and cannot be truly known if this order is reversed. Heidegger himself, ever the creature of his early theological teaching, came close to realising this in his attempts to de deliver the language of truth from the confines of every form of positivism, but ultimately he proved too forgetful of the radical question of beauty that Christian thought had raised, and so retreated back again along the tenebrous woodland path of ontological necessity in search of the how it is of the event rather than the that it is of the world. Well, it's all very good, I agree. It's magnificent. Um, and there is no way that I can come at or even compete with and sometimes even appreciate the intellect of David Bentley Hart. But I will say this, that Howard has said all of these things in the language of making itself. She has not resorted to the language of philosophy to demonstrate the need for us to remain fleshed, if you will. Does that make sense? The wonder of Harwood's poem is that she understands precisely David Bentley Hart's words. And yet, unlike Bentley Hart, she uses the poetic form to do it. She uses music to do it. So to apprehend her, we have to use this, not this, well, both, but And I suppose the thing for me, if I can be a little bit confessional for a minute, is that how it illuminates the world of women in all their materiality, and we have plenty of it, particularly when our children are really young, right? There's lots of nappies. Howard remains firmly suburban and firmly domestic. Howard's vision seems as far from the sacraments as Tasmania is from Ro Rome. Tasmania is where she raised her children. And yet, Howard's insistence on the domestic and the local is preempted and solicited by the Eucharist itself. Um, I think that's the, the second line here I want to get to, that, that the faithfulness to her locale and to her life is in fact the most orthodox position of all, to remain committed to where we are. Um, I think as a, a little girl, when people used to say things to me like, you know, we've got to become more Christ-like. I always found that a bit exhausting because I felt like underneath that was somehow <laughs> what that meant was always remain um, controlled and rational and um, good, all the things that I failed to be as a young girl, as my mum and dad will attest. Yes, dad? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I think that the freedom that Harwood offers is that you've actually got to begin with you. With your particular fleshness and the way your body moves in the world. And there are particular ways of my body moving in the world 
that illuminate Christ to me in ways that are different, but absolutely bang as close as we're ever going to get. I'm going to finish with um, Kathleen Norris um, and a little story that she told. Kathleen Norris, um, she's a lovely thinker. She wrote a book called The Quotidian Mysteries. I recommend it to you all. She tells the story of going to, um, she's a Protestant like many of us here in the room. Um, she went to a Catholic wedding and then somehow was invited into the back of, um, into the, the kitchen after the, the wedding mass had been performed and she saw the priest standing there in his robes washing up the chalice. Um, and she couldn't get over it. I don't understand. Well, aren't, aren't you like the decorated guy? <laughs> aren't you the guy who's supposed to be? And he was washing up the chalice. And she says, I find it remarkable and still find it remarkable that in that big fancy church, after all of the dress up and the formalities of the wedding mass, homage was being paid to the lowly truth that we human beings must wash the dishes after we eat and drink. The chalice, which had held the very blood of Christ, was no exception. <laughs> um, and I actually think that's what Harwood's poetry and all poetry, perhaps all art does, is that it is committed to the corporeal or, or the, the particular way that human beings apprehend anything is through our senses, through our eyes, through our ears, through the way we touch things, smell things. That is where we apprehend the true mystery of what God has done through Christ on this earth. I'm going to stop there. Thank you for listening to me.